Hi, everybody. So um, the last topic for the course is uh, to look at the proof of three theorems about finite groups called the Silo theorems. These are um, more or less converses or partial converses to Lagrange's theorem, and they give you a lot of structural information about groups based on subgroups of prime power order. And uh, this is an application of our work on group actions. And the most important tool is going to be the action of the group on itself by conjugation and the class equation. OK, so um, let's start by proving a theorem that we've kind of hinted at and beaten around the bush quite a bit throughout the class. And that's Cauchy's theorem, which says that if you have a finite group of order n, and a prime divisor of n, so p here is prime, uh, then g has a subgroup of order p. So we proved this in our classification of finite abelian groups for abelian groups. Um, and now we're going to prove it for all groups. And again, we're going to do it by induction. And we're going to combine induction with the class equation. So remember that the class equation says that the order of g is equal to the sum of the number of elements in the center of G plus a contribution from each conjugacy class. This is the uh, sum over the conjugacy classes. This number is the number of elements in that conjugacy class, but it's also the index of the centralizer of a representative for uh, that conjugacy class, where we only count the conjugacy classes of size greater than one in this part of the sum. The conjugacy classes of size 1 are all taken accounted for by the center of G. So um, the proof goes as follows. We look at this sum. I'll just rewrite the sum here so we remember. This is the class equation again. And um, we know that the left-hand side of this uh, is divisible by p. So um, there's sort of two possibilities. Either um, none of these indices are divisible by p, or at least one of them is divisible by p. So let's first assume that none of them are divisible by p. Well, that means that the index of the subgroup c of xi in g is not divisible by p. But remember that the order of g is the number of elements in the centralizer. This is true for any subgroup, times the index. So if this number is not divisible by p, and p does divide this, then the only possibility is that p must divide the order of the centralizer. And if p divides the order of the centralizer of xi, then since the order of the centralizer of xi is less than the order of g, I mean, I'm assuming here that g is non-abelian. Uh, if g is abelian, then um, everything is in the center, and we've already treated that case. So the centralizer is a subgroup of g. And if the centralizer is a subgroup of g, then by induction, there's a subgroup H in the centralizer of order P. But if you're a subgroup of the centralizer, which in turn is a subgroup of G, then you're a subgroup of G. So um, if any of these indices are not divisible by P, um, then you apply the inductive hypothesis and find a subgroup of index P. On the other hand, if all of the centralizers are divisible by p, then that means that in this sum, everything here is a multiple of p. Let me uh, let me rewrite the um, the sum one more time. So if let's use and let's use a different color. So if these are all divisible by p. And this is divisible by p. 
then that forces this to be divisible by p. But that means that the center of G, which is an abelian group, has order divisible by P, and we have already treated that case. So the, since the center of G is abelian and has order divisible by P, it contains a subgroup of order P. So if H has P elements, and H is a subgroup of the center of G, which is in turn a subgroup of G, this tells us that H is a subgroup of G with P elements. So either way, you win. Either one of these centralizers has order divisible by P, and then you use the inductive hypothesis, or the center has order divisible by P, and the center is abelian, so you apply what you know about abelian groups, and either way, you construct an element of order P in G. So uh, we had talked about abelian P groups. An abelian P group was an abelian group, all of whose elements had order of power of p, or equivalently, if the number of elements in the group had um, was a prime power order. Now we can generalize that to groups that aren't necessarily abelian. Um, so suppose you have a, a finite group uh, and you have a prime number p, then these two conditions are equivalent. Every element of g has order that is a power of p, or the order of G itself is a power of P. Um, it's clear, one direction is clear. If the order of G is a power of P, then every element of G has to have order dividing that, so it must also be a power of P. So one direction, if we call this A and this B, A implies B by Lagrange, because the order, if X is in G, the order of X has to divide the order of G, which is a prime power, and that tells you that the order of X is a power of P between zero and R. I mean, if it's the identity, it has order one. But the, the new information is that B implies A, and that's because um, if every element of G has an order of power of P, then the only divisors of um, the order of G are the only prime divisors are is P. So if um, uh, if it happened that G, I guess we could just do it this way. If the order of G is not equal to a power of P, then that implies that G has an element X of order equal to Q, where Q is a prime different from P, because the order of G must have an, at least another prime divisor. And that would contradict uh, every element of G has order of power of P. So, um, so these two conditions are equivalent, and such groups are called P groups. So uh, for instance, the, um, the quaternion group, which has eight elements, and it's not abelian, this is a two group because its order is a power of two. Okay, now we're in a position to prove uh, the, the first of the three Silo theorems. And it's a strengthening of the result that we just proved. That we just showed that if a power, of, if P divides the order of G, then G has a subgroup of order P. Now we're going to improve that result, and we're going to say if some power of P divides the order of G, then G has a subgroup of that prime power order. So for example, if you have a group which is, whose order is divisible by 27, then not only do, do you have an element of order 3, which is what Cauchy's theorem would give you, but you actually have a subgroup of order 27. Not necessarily an element of order 27, but a subgroup of order 27. And the proof is similar to the proof of Cauchy's theorem. We just have to be a little bit more careful. And um, again, we start with the class equation, and we assume that G has P to the R elements, 
and r is bigger than 1. Because if r were equal to 1, then we're all, we already, uh, sorry, p to the r, that's not the right way to say it. We're going to assume that p to the r divides the order of g, but p to the and r is bigger than 1. Because if r were equal to 1, that would just mean that the order of g was a multiple of p, and we already know uh, that it has an element of order p. So the interesting case, or the new case, is when a higher power of p divides the order of g. So we use the same idea as in Cauchy's theorem. It's again an inductive proof, and we again look at all the terms in the sum. And we again point out that if any of these uh, indices are not divisible by p, so uh, if, this, if the index is not divisible by p, then that means that the order of the centralizer is divisible, p to the r. Because, again, we know that the order of g is the product of these two things. And if this is divisible by p to the r, and this is not divisible by p at all, then this must be divisible by p to the r. So um, we conclude from this that uh, and in that case, if the centralizer of Xi has order divisible by P to the R, and it's of order small, strictly smaller than the order of G, so by induction, we use the same idea. By induction, C, the centralizer of Xi has a subgroup with p to the r elements, um, because that's the inductive hypothesis. And that subgroup, let's call it h, h is also a subgroup of g. And, and so we found a subgroup with p to the r elements. So now we're back in the case that we were in in Cauchy's theorem, the other case, which is that all of these indices are divisible by p. Uh, and if that's the case, looking once again at the formula, we're again in the situation from Cauchy's theorem. Um, we know that p divides this. all of these, and p divides this, so p divides this, and that means that we have a subgroup h in the center of g with p elements. Because um, it's the Cauchy's theorem situation. The center of g is an abelian group and p divides its order, so it contains a subgroup of order p. Now, the crucial fact is that this is a normal subgroup, because any subgroup of the center is normal, right? h is contained in the center of g means that g h equals h g. In fact, even more, even more strongly, we know that g x equals x g for all x in h, although we don't, I mean, the center, elements of the center commute with everything. So even more than having, being able to move g past the subgroup h, we can actually move it past the individual elements. So any subgroup of the center is going to be a normal subgroup. And um, that means we can take the quotient group, g mod h. And g mod h has n over p elements. And g mod h has n over p elements, which is uh, a multiple of p to the r minus 1. 
because we divide h has order p, p to the r divided the order of g. So in the factor group, we're going to have p to the r minus 1 uh, dividing the quotient. And since the order of g mod h is smaller than the order of g, we know that g mod h has a subgroup k with p to the r minus 1 elements. And now we need to get from this subgroup of g mod h back to a subgroup of g. And for that, we um, use the canonical homomorphism. So we have this map, the canonical homomorphism from g to g mod h, which sends g and g to the coset g h in g mod h. And this map is p to 1, because if you look at an at a, the um, I mean you look at a point if you take let's say g h in the in the um, factor group the set of g such that let's call them g prime such that g prime h equals g h is exactly the coset which has p elements. If we now take our subgroup k inside g mod h, and we take k twiddle to be the collection of g in g, so that the coset g h is in the subgroup k, then k twiddle is a subgroup of g, and it has p to the r elements, namely p times as many elements as k. So k twiddle is the subgroup we are looking for. And that's the proof of the first of the three Celo theorems.